Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Professor Emeritus James Kass. James was the Director of Religious Studies at New York University for 30 years and the recipient of numerous teaching awards. He is the author of several books, including one of the most interesting and profound books that Paul has read recently, Finite and Infinite Games, which has been published in more than a dozen languages. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I am super excited to share an amazing man with you today, James Kars. James Kars is the author of The Case Against Religious Belief and in another, another excellent book, Finite Infinite Games, and many more. He's got several great books out there. So, James, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Well, I've uh, I've I've almost finished reading A Case Against Religious Belief. I've been through Finite and Infinite Games on audio and the book and have a, a whole lot of notes because it was quite deep. <laughs> right. And uh, I found it uh, beautiful and profound. And um, uh, any one sentence in that book I find to be worthy of contemplative meditation. And I've spent uh, a fair bit of time doing just that. And uh, I really, as as much as I want to talk about the case against religious belief, I'm hoping we can do another podcast on that one because I think that's a very important book. And well, I'm um, glad you think so. I do too. Oh, it's it's profound. It's it, you know these are the things I teach my students. And when I found that book and read it, it was such a great confirmation for the concerns I have mm -hmm. based on the challenges that religion presents. Right. So, and and the danger of belief systems. And um, I think, you know, we can tie some of that in with mythology when we get there. But uh, Not for so uh, I'm really, really uh, excited to, to talk about these things. James, um, you know, you've written a number of books on many topics of deep interest to, uh, to me. Could you give us an overview of your developmental background, your professional work and what you do now? Well, I spent my entire professional career uh, as a professor, uh, and that whole time was at New York University, where I was, uh, I had the title Professor of the History and Literature of Religion. Very cool. Yeah, New York uh, University is a, is a secular institution, uh, and it turned out over the years, I was essentially the only person teaching that subject. Uh, and what that meant was I could teach uh, as I wished. There was no, uh, I could explore any aspect of religion or as, as it turned out, philosophy as well, because I'm trained in that too, uh, in philosophy. So I can see that <laughs> reading your books. That's pretty oh, obvious. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so I, I taught uh, a wide range of subjects uh, and uh, enjoyed it enormously. I taught 30 years at NYU, retired young, but retired early, but uh, it was a fabulous place to teach. Uh, and uh, living in New York City and teaching there was, uh, you know, an education in itself. Yeah, that's fantastic. You've written a lot of books and, uh, one of the ones I want to read is your book. I don't remember the exact title, but it's where you uh, basically do 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 uh, take the effort of trying to convey the teachings of Jesus in a more uh, I'll use the word holistic light. <laughs> well, yeah, I I decided you know that's a that would be an interesting discussion in itself. One of the uh, first forms of Christian literature after the death of Jesus was writing gospels. Uh, scholars know of about 120, I think, 20 gospels floating around in the ancient world, uh, mostly over the first two centuries or so. And I thought it would be interesting to revive that tradition and write a gospel. I mean, after all, people, that's what mostly uh, most people did when they heard the teachings of Jesus. Right. So I, I, I wrote my own gospel. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> great, great time doing it. I even went to Jerusalem to write it. I spent, uh, you know, that's where I started it. That's a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it's funny because Christians have this, well, the fundamentalist Christians have this, uh, shall we say, closed belief system in which they believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's never been changed and right. all that. But it's, it's uh, you know, if you study the history of the Bible, it's exactly as you say, it's, it's a really a collection of books written by a bunch of people that, you know, the Council of Nicaea and, and related it, what, 325 and 550, I think it was, they decided what they were going to keep to support the church's agenda. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah. I've studied a lot of the work of a professor named Luke Timothy Johnson. Are you familiar with him? Yes, I am. Yeah, I really loved his breakdown of the Gospels. Yeah, he no, it's a very good book that he wrote on the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I said, I've I've uh, almost finished your book titled The Religious Case Against Belief. And to me, the book had an almost atheistic tone. Having listened to the whole uh, uh, book, Finite Infinite Games, I found no indication of the source of the philosophical, so philosophical disposition of the book. Right. Um, I looked through the books you have on Amazon. There are several dealing with religious material, as I was alluding to earlier. Could you please share an encapsulation of your own living philosophy and what the word God, i.e., I have God broken. I teach God as two things. God, G, capital G, little o, little d, is really just people's ideas about God. Right. And then capital G, capital O, capital D, I define as the absolute or the unknowable, that which we cannot grapple with the mind because the mind itself is a cutting device. It always has to separate things out or there can be no identification. So ideas, of course, are the products of mind. But when I use the word God with my students, I'm saying it's a mystery. You can't define it. You can experience it, but you right. cannot define it. So I'm just curious, what is your living philosophy? And how do I'm asking this because when I read Finite Infinite Games, I really could not find anything in there that gave me an indication of what James Carse believes. Well, in the in the book, uh, the religious case against belief. Uh, this may shock a lot of people, but I think belief itself is not the proper way to express your religious feelings. Uh, believing is believing is an, an intellectual or mental act, and if you look at it very carefully and you look at it analytically, now I'm now I'm thinking as a philosopher. That's all right. Belief is where your thinking stops. Yes. And and if you are the kind of inquisitive, deeply uh, puzzled, deeply affected, a person deeply affected by mysteries, uh, your thinking doesn't stop. And it goes, it goes beyond belief. So most beliefs for people who have that the kind of uh, mental curiosity, spiritual curiosity you're talking about, you referred to, uh, for people like that, b believing is the point for, of departure, not the point of arrival. Yes. So once you, you get your belief systems worked out, then go to work on them and see where they fall short. And, Amen. Yeah. And now, now it's part of my, a large part of my own spiritual background uh, comes from the study of the mystics, mostly medieval mystics, mostly uh, Jewish and Arab, but also a few Christian mystics, uh, a, a, a few few big ones. Yeah, uh, but, I bet you Eckhart's one of them too. Yeah, but Meister Eckhart is definitely on my list. Um, the um, uh, the and uh, I, I loved the uh, uh, the Muslim mystics, the Arab mystics. They were me too. Terrific. Uh, so th their thinking is really, th the core of their thinking is quite simple. Namely, uh, if God is one, uh, your understanding, your uh, knowledge of God is something other than that one. <laughs> it, yeah. It makes two, right? Exactly. And God. And so, so something's not working out here. Uh, so, so the way the mystics looked at it is to say that whatever you say about God is, in fact, wrong. Yep. So take it as wrong, and 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 so work out your uh, work out your best possible uh, system of thinking 
and then look at that as not God, as something other than God. A kind of the via negativa is is what the uh, the mystics like to refer to. There's a yes. negative path, yes, uh, 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 th- that you follow uh, to get there, but you don't get there. You 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 uh, you what you do is develop your ignorance. Yes, uh, to uh, to an, as far as you can take it. Uh, and that's one of the things I did in my teaching, by the way. I, I, I thought of myself as a teacher whose uh, primary responsibility, primary challenge was to enlarge my students, under, their sense of ignorance, their sense of mystery about the world. Uh, instead of knowledge, I wanted them to learn how ignorant they were. <laughs> and that's, yes. And, and that's, that's part of my, uh, that, that's a core of my, that gets right at the core of my own spiritual uh, religious views. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, you, you've triggered a couple points I'd like to share. One, whenever we're talking about God, I, I remind people the word about means around. It is not a word that, in, that, it, that indicates penetration or engaging something factual or experiential. It's just no, sort of like – yeah. Uh-huh. It's just going around and around and around and 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 look where that's gotten us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. And you know, I've got the entire collected works of Rumi. I've been studying them for a very oh, long time yeah. and to to All me right. that's the that's the creme de la creme right there. Oh, yeah, I Rumi, think um, yeah. I just love Rumi and the first principle of Sufism is one I, I live by, and I actually have it written on my computer screen here so I can remind myself every day. And it says, there is no God but God. I worship yeah. everything and everyone. And it seems to me that the fundamentalists would do far better to study the mystics and realize that they were the ones that penetrated the depths of the mystery of the ignorance. And almost all of them are telling us just what you're saying that you can't right. define god and that you know the what what we can do is we can love and we can appreciate and we can experience and enjoy and create beauty and harmony and i think that's what's been lost in 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 the whole concept of religion actually um more than lost it's been reversed yes so as that, corporate religion it flipped it over uh yeah. So where, where there used to be mystery, now there's there's so-called positive knowledge, certainty that this is the way, that's the truth, and so on. Uh, I I'm very much uh, I'm very uncomfortable with that view. Me too. It's extremely dangerous. I call all that corporate religion. Are you familiar with the uh, Richard Wilhelm Wilhelm's edition of the Tao Te Ching at all? Uh, oh. You know, I might. Yeah, I I know. Uh, I th- I'm, I'm sure I read it at some point. I remember the translation. It was a new translation. I, yeah. I, I was still working on the old one, but uh, but I I don't have a copy of it. I have the old one. Yeah, Richard Wilhelm. I, I, this one's probably I would guess 35 or more years yeah, old. I, I remember when the translation came out. Yeah, he was a friend of Carl Jung's and. Very, very deep, amazing man. But in the back of his book, he has a breakdown and he gives the history of the concepts of Taoism and Lao Tzu and shows very clearly how the rulers of the day would bring in the masters, the spiritual teachers. They would then have those masters convey to them the meanings of the teachings, and then they completely manipulated them in order to create uh, a religious ideology that would result in people conforming to exactly what they wanted to do to control them. Yeah, that's right. Well, right. Um, and, yeah, it was, it was, um, <laughs> that's right. It had, it's funny. Uh, it resulted in the, uh, uh, the one of the, the results are the very opposition to it. Um, yes. The, because the, the Tao, the way, uh, you know, I, the, one of the ways I used to point it out to students is that uh, one of the myths about uh, Lao Tzu is that he, um, 
decided at one point to give up civilization. You probably know the story. Yes, yeah. And he walked into the desert, and no one knows what happened to him. He uh, he just walked out, essentially out of the world, out of the the mind of the public at that time. Yes, yeah. And uh, but that's that's one of the ways you approach uh, the whole idea of Taoism. And by by the way, Paul, I um, I didn't realize it when I was writing the book on games, finite and infinite games. Uh, but a friend, a very a learned philosopher, a friend of mine, uh, pointed out when he read the manuscript that I'd just finished that this is a Taoist uh, book. It was. It's, uh, wait it's, a minute. Wait a minute. That's right. I, yeah. just, I just wrote a Taoist uh, treatise, you know, and and I I think he's right. Absolutely right about that. I do too. Be, but you see, but the, the the thing that the especially the and we'll get into this, but especially the parts on the infinite games. I just kept having this vision of the Tao that can't be spoken. That's right. That's right. That's, that's appropriate. And uh, you know, that's why I I said to you, I I. I really couldn't find the philosophical underpinning because it was as though it was, well, to, to kind of use a word that I think might fit your lexicon, it was as though silence was speaking the book. Yeah, that, that makes it, that, I, I, I would accept that. That's, I think, potentially, I think that, <laughs> and I don't mean this in a negative, but as a guy who's spent a lot of time studying philosophy and religion and all the related aspects of it, I think that's probably one of the big challenges people are going to have because their minds are like most people that are, you know, programmed with religious ideas are going to constantly be looking for some point of anchor. But really, right. I, I found the book uh, left me feeling like a shooting star flying through emptiness, going everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> hey, I, I, that's um, I, I wish you'd been one of my students. <laughs> I, I wish the hell I was, too, but I am now. <laughs> You got me with those two books. And I did read, uh, I think it was Breakfast at, at Victory. I read some sections in that one yeah. too. And uh, that was more of a conversational book. Um, you know, so I, I enjoyed what I read, but I I felt that, you know, the, the case against religious belief and finite and infinite games was penetrating the things that I feel are very interesting for me to not only help deepen my own understanding, but to be a better teacher and a better leader for people. Mm hmm. Good. Uh, I'm I'm del I'm flattered. I, I'm uh, pleased to hear that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your contribution contributions. Hi, this is Paul Check, and I am super excited to share an amazing line of super nutritional products that I found called Organifi. O R G A N I F I. If you go to Organifi.com and check out their product line, they have a wide variety of excellent products. And unlike any food-based product company that's ever showed interest in sponsoring the Czech Institute or any of my courses or products or videos or any of the projects I've done that stated they were organic, when I asked them for their organic certification, I never got them. I have been through this before. When I contacted Organifi and asked to see their documentation that they were legitimately using organic source materials. Very quickly, I got an email with 14 organic certifications showing that their source materials are certified organic. Then I put the products to the test with my family and on my own body, and I must say I was very impressed. They have a wide variety. They have green juice, red juice. They have a product called Gold that aids with sleep, muscle aches and pains, and joint stiffness. It helps bolster your immunity. It's awesome. One of my favorites is called Pure, and it's got lion's mane. It's bobab infused. It's great for gut health, brain performance. Lion's Mane is excellent for stimulating neurogenesis. I love to give it to my son, Mana. Another one that's fantastic is Immunity, which is an organic superfood product, and it supports your immune system. It tastes fantastic. I like to put these right in some water and mix them in and drink them or put them into tea. They have a variety of great stuff like green juices, red juice, 
They have Organifi Gold. It aids with restless sleep, muscle aches and pain, stiff joints, bolsters your immunity. You'll wake up feeling rejuvenated if you have that in the evening. They have awesome protein powders. Angie's about to give birth to our second child, and she's been really enjoying their protein powder. Their products are safe for pregnant mothers. I'm a very picky guy, and I'm hard to impress when it comes to food products, but these guys really got me. I love the products. If you are ready to try some amazing products that can really make your life more efficient if you don't have time to do a lot of cooking, you're a busy executive or you're a mother and you've got lots going on and you need something to give your kids now and then that's legitimately nutritious, good for them, and organic, which means clean and high in nutrients, you can't go wrong with Organifi. Go to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com, and when you're checking out, put in check 20s, lowercase c, lowercase h, lowercase e, lowercase k, 20, and you will get a 20% off at checkout, and you will be amazed, just like I was. Can't wait to hear your feedback. Check them out. O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com. When you're checking out, use the code C-H-E-K-20 for a 20% discount and prepare to be nourished, enlivened, and amazed. I'd love to hear your feedback. You know, I shared in my introduction, uh, I found your book, Finite and Infinite Games, very powerful I'd love it if you could share what inspired you to write this book and what was it that you intended people to learn from the book? Well, uh, there, the book has a lot of sources in a way, but I'll, I'll give you the, the, the simplest uh, kind of event to explain it. Uh, there was a, a group of uh, professors at NYU who got together, uh, organized by uh, uh, one of them, to talk about game theory. This was way back. This was probably 1970 or so, 71, 72, when game theory was just becoming very popular in the academy. Right. Uh, and also in, in many areas in, in uh, uh, sort of the technological world and so on. So. Um, I was I was in a group of about twelve professors uh, from every discipline, uh, scientific, sociological, literary, and so on. And I was the philosopher in the group. Uh, and I I was sitting uh, listening to these uh, these very learned folks, the men and women, talking about game theory. And I, I realized in the conversation that there was no one was interested. They were all really interested either in winning a game or reducing your losses in a game, but no one was interested in the play of a game. Right. And so I thought it would be, it, it would, it would be very interesting to look at the phenomenon of play itself. And of course, what I had at that time, I had, I had three young children, <laughs> so so I had a you know in, in, in a New York apartment. So I right. had a, I had a laboratory, yes, uh, of playfulness right there uh, that was both good and bad. You know, if they could, if they were playing uh, some, if they were playing a fantasy game where they made things up as they went along, they all played happily. But once they got into a very specific game with rules uh, and so on. No matter who won, everyone was unhappy at the end. Uh, and I thought, whoa, wait, wait a minute, this is telling me something. And so I, I, one, of the, one of the first insights I had is that when you play, when you're playing an infinite, a finite game, one of the things you want to do, of course, is to, in, in winning the game, you want to end the play as soon as possible, meaning you're really playing not to play. Right, <laughs> and, so, and so your your the the, the play your 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 play playfulness in a finite game is actually contradictory. You're playing against yourself, and so yes. I thought, well, what would happen if you open that up and say, well, 
than just play. And then I got the idea of a game that doesn't end and called it an infinite game. So um, that's that's kind of the easy way of talking about how I got to it. I, I have some uh, philosophical um, stuff, too, that gets probably deeper than you, most of your listeners really want to get to. But um, anyway, well, I yeah. doubt it. I doubt it. Hit me. <laughs> well, I, I, sure, I'll try. I, I remember one of my uh, big philosophical, uh, I, I won't quite say heroes, but certainly one of my big sources <clears throat> is the Austrian philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Sure. Wittgenstein uh, wrote uh, an amazing book when he was a young man. Actually, he was a soldier in the First World War, and he wrote a book called the Philosoph- uh, the uh, uh, philoso- Logico Philosophico uh, Philosophical Tractatus, referred to simply as a tractatus. Uh, and he wrote it, he wrote it in the, uh, during, uh, in the war. He wrote it in, uh, actually, uh, in the trenches, believe it or not. That's wild. Uh, and then he, he published it. Uh, he was about 21 or two, something, something like that. Uh, the book made its way finally to Cambridge, where Bertrand Russell, who was the star there of the philosophy department, read it. He was so impressed with the book, uh, still not translated, he read it in German, uh, that he um, he called Wittgenstein, who hadn't finished his uh, studies at all, called him up from Austria, put him on the faculty at Cambridge, and gave him a doctorate. That's for awesome. Study. <laughs> right. So so he started off as an amazing star, drew a lot of students and so on. And then he then he he um, he went through a, a process I admire in any philosopher or in any human being, too. He changed his mind. He, he was around these Cambridge philosophers who at the time were were really caught up in the kind of thing he was writing about, which is which is what we call in, in uh, the philosophical tradition a logical positivism. It's a it's a way of of studying language as though it has a logical uh, quality, right? And and uh, and he said he thought to himself, you know, that's not that's not really the way it works, and uh, and in his. And then he began, he be, his students began writing down his lectures, his comments. They weren't even lectures, really. They were, they were mostly off, off the cuff that came out of conversations with the students. And I remember when I was a graduate student reading one of these books called the Blue and Brown Books. Uh, no, they were just the notebooks of students uh, reading this, this statement. Uh, the meaning of a word is not what it stands for. It's what comes of it. Now, that doesn't strike most people as an amazing remark. But if you, th- if you knew the uh, history of the way in which language was understood, uh, really from the time of the Greeks to, the, to the, essentially to Wittgenstein himself, language was thought to have, word, each word was thought to have some kind of a, of a referent in the real world. Right. So if, you, if your language was to make sense, it had to it had to function as a series of names for things that were really there. Uh, so this was called the, the signum race, the sign and the thing relationship. Right. The word is the sign, and then it has if it means anything, it has to have a thing that's uh, that corresponds to it. Well, Wittgenstein said that's not the way it works at all. Uh, what I say to you is important. Only, only by virtue of what you do with what I say. Right. Now, if nothing comes of what I say, in effect, I haven't said anything. And my, it's just my, my voice going, making sound in the air. Right. So, so that has a, a striking, absolutely shocking consequence. Namely, when I talk to you, I don't know what I'm saying until you respond. Yes, that's that's uh, beautiful and profound. And what comes to me that I, I hate to interject, but when you're describing exactly what you're saying about words and our intended meaning versus the action in the other, I think probably the most potent word to really encapsulate what you're saying is the word love. 
Oh well, fine. That, of course, <laughs> right? Because uh, we it can it can we can mean one thing inside of ourselves, but it can be interpreted in a myriad of ways and cause a myriad of responses, which may or may not be congruent with our intention. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you you might you might use the word and find out. Hmm, no one no one thinks you love them. Right? right exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, sure. That, no, that, that's but that's true. Of all, you, you're right. I mean, that's the way that word works. But, but all language works that way. Now, yeah. now, what I thought was, therefore, we're all engaged in not only not only do I wait to see what went on. Well, what what will go on after what I've talked about? But I've been using language that other people have used for centuries, millennia. So my, what they meant is actually involved in what I'm saying. I, in a sense, I'm giving meaning to a whole history behind me, a whole linguistic history. So so think of it as a, as a continuity of. Of, of meaning that comes from the past, goes through me, goes through any modern speaker, any present speaker, uh, into the future. Uh, well, that's, and there's no beginning or end to that. Uh, no. Language does, doesn't start somewhere. It, it, it's already underway by the time people started talking. And, and, uh, and it doesn't end anywhere particularly. It doesn't, it doesn't have a conclusion, uh, that kind of thing. So that, that's another source of what I meant by inf- infinite. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, that's why I, I say uh, that we don't we don't have a history as though there's a big past behind us. We live a history. We are part of what's behind us and part of what follows us. So so we are we are living, active, dynamic members of an ongoing process that has neither beginning nor end. Sounds to me like a seed. Uh, yeah, well, that, no, that's that, that. It is a seed. That's why I, I use the uh, metaphor of the garden in the games book. Yes, it's it's a very appropriate garden. I yeah, mean, appropriate appropriate uh, analogy. I think. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's that, that's the uh, uh, the philosophical background of my thinking about the games. Well, I, I think it's absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, the book is so deep and so profound. I mean, I hang out with some pretty intelligent people, and I've devoted my life to deep study and practice of metaphysics, Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, uh, philosophy, and you know, I'm going to have to read that book ten, maybe twelve <laughs> times. Just, in fact, uh, after I'm off the air, I want to see if I can hire you as a tutor so that I can really make sure I don't mislead myself. Yeah, right. But well, yeah, uh, go ahead. One of the things you brought up that I think is really important, it's something I discuss a lot. And I'll preface my by saying this, you know, we we have the rational elements of our mind and our, our experience, but we also have the unrational. And just like the Tai Chi symbol shows the complementary opposites of yin and yang, where where there's rationality, there has to be an element of counterbalance in the unrational expression, which we could say is emotion versus logic. And our culture has become so caught in its left brain. I, as a therapist, I am routinely working with professionals, be they athletes or business executives, people of all types that have completely burned themselves out in pursuit of what they think is some rational end, i.e. X number of dollars in the bank or the, sure. the creation of a business or whatever, but they're completely and utterly exhausted. And what I've found is that we, we've lost our connection to what I would call the poetry of life. And we have completely got ourselves into this position where, especially for adults, the concept of play is, is something that's uh, seen to be only for children. And I think that the concept of play is, is as important as the rational. And, and I think it's extremely important that human beings re-engage what I call unbound play, an activity with no attachment to the outcome. Because people like I, you know, the number one rate of suicide a few years back when I looked into this uh, in teenagers was in uh, Japan had the highest and New Zealand had the second height 
highest rate of teenage suicide, and researchers tracked it right back to scholastic standards and scholastic pressures amongst these children. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this is terrible. Here's the people that are going to become our leaders tomorrow, and they're already killing themselves because of their own judgments as to how good they are, which is all based on some rational ideology that's a ghost. It ha often mm -hmm. has, when you consider that 50% of people that graduate from universities are not even working in the field they were trained in university within five years, it seems that we've, we've kind of rationalized ourselves right into this sort of false meaning, and it's producing nothing but an emptiness that I find can only really be filled by unbound play. Right. I, I uh, as you understand, I would understand, I, I very much agree with that. But I, I think I would even extend it to uh, say that the uh, in, even very difficult and deep intellectual work is one of the forms of play. Yes. Yeah, that, is to say, that is to say, it's not as if uh, it's it, it, it's not as if we go on vacation to play, but we 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 understand our work, our, our deep work, even if it's ordinary, everyday kind of physical labor, as part of that of uh, as as a form of play itself uh, that has a lot of open ends to it. And and I think that that makes a lot of difference about the way people uh, conduct their daily lives. To to see, not not just to see that play is a good thing, but but how much of what they do can be understood as a form of play. I agree. It's very zen. Uh, what you've just okay. shared. That's zen. That's zen. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh. It's you know, Taoist and zen. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of of the teaching zen teaching story. Uh, a student has been studying with a master for about a year. And one morning he's sitting by himself at the breakfast table with the master and he's got a chance to ask this question he feels is quite embarrassing. And he says to the master, he says, master, I've been here for a year with you studying intensely, doing everything you've asked me to do. And I am still completely confused as to what the Buddha is. Can you tell me what the Buddha is? And the master says, have you eaten your breakfast yet? And, <laughs> and he says, yes. He says, then wash your bowl and go rake some leaves. <laughs> yeah, right. No, that, that's, a, that's a very typical uh, you know, Zen story. Satori in the morning and then do the laundry in the afternoon. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, I think if we, you know, Satori here being an exchangeable word for unbound play, uh, because what's the Satori? It's the realization that you are one with all that is. And clearly, uh, there's no outcome that we can really identify. We can't really identify an origin either. Even, even modern science, mainstream science, has its entire foundation of cosmology built on a complete unknown called what caused the so-called Big Bang. Right. So they're building sure. what looks like rational scientific materialistic science which they claim is based on sound scientific principles, but it begins from the same place that religion does. Well, yeah, right. Um, the, uh, at, at New York University, some years ago, I wish I remembered the name of this, this gentleman, but a member of the, uh, I think he was a professor in the medical school, won a Nobel Prize. And so there was a big ceremony, a big reception to honor him. And he came out, he was introduced, and he got applause. His first words were, we are in the ignorance business. Uh, he, spoke, uh, he, said, uh, he spoke as a scientist. We, uh, what, we, what we do is work with ignorance. And I think that's, that's, the, kind of, uh, that's the kind of deep playfulness that uh, should, should characterize uh, not only scholarship but as you say all all kinds all kinds of life now the the young man who was asking for what the buddha is wanted a specific concrete answer uh oh that's what the buddha is that right there you know yeah. and so uh, a rational well, that's, answer that's not possible yes and no like the buddha himself according you know according to the ancient uh, tr the uh, ancient mythologies or legends about him um refused 
uh, to make himself the center of Buddhism. Right. Uh, as you know, it was the community and it was the Dharma and uh, the teachings and so on that were the center of Buddhism, not 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 the Buddha. Uh, no. Which, yeah, which is, very, you know, qu- quite fascinating. Well, it's also kind of hand in hand with the saying, Jesus was not a Christian. Yeah, that's, that's right. No, you that's know? right. Yeah. Uh, he never heard the word church, for example. Right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, yeah, was not no, the Greek word. No, that was he wouldn't have known that. Yes. You know, in the Hindu scriptures, we find concepts such as Maya or the grand illusion and Layla, yeah. the dance or the play. Yeah. In, in Christianity, God's often described with the prefix omni, such as omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on. When right. you use the term infinite games, are you suggesting that we uh, what may be referred to as source or what I'd refer to as, you know, God in all caps, unconditional love, the absolute pure potential or consciousness in caps as opposed to conscious of is, is that what we're talking about when we're talking about playing games infinitely? If so, well, do you f- that, that it depends on how you talk about that, that kind of thing. Yeah, it could be very well. Um, and, uh, you, you know, when, when you when you want if you want to pick up, if you want to enter into the mystical dialogue, uh, then I think you, uh, if you enter into that, uh, it makes a lot of it, it, it's a good portal into talking about what I'm thinking about in infinite play. Yes. Uh, if with that stated, what do you feel the ultimate reason or function of the games is be they infinite well the infinite in particular but since the finite games couldn't exist without the infinite game to underpin it what do you feel after your life of deep study and contemplation is the function of these games well uh, l- l- let's take it at a simple level of a uh, simple definition of finite play to begin with a finite game is a game you play to win uh, that's the purpose of the game, and for someone to win. But to do that, if it's if it's truly to be effective as as a game at, with a with a, a, a agreed upon winner, you need a number of conditions. Number one, you need rules. You need uh, a specified number of players. Uh, you need a time limit. You need uh, sometimes a physical limit, uh, and so on. You, uh, but everyone has to agree to those limits before they start playing. And w- uh, once they do, they can they can therefore, if they agree to all those rules, all those dimensions of the of the finite game, they'll also agree to who has won the game. Uh, and that's that's crucial to finite play. Sometimes they may resent who's won it, but at least. They have to admit that it's been won fairly. Now, right. an infinite game, an infinite game, is not necessarily contradictory to a finite game because you can play finite games in the larger context of of infinite play, and that's defined differently. That's uh, an infinite player plays not to win the game and end play, but to continue the play uh, and find ways of keeping all of the players not only in the game, uh, free them from from, uh, losing, finding ways of keeping the play going. Uh, And that, that, it doesn't mean that you give up rules. It means that you have rules, you have procedures, you have norms, you have agreements, but they may have to change to keep the game going, to keep people from losing, to find new players and so on. Um, it, it's a very different understanding of what rules and laws are. Uh, so you, you've, you've got those two ways of thinking about engaging with each other. They're not necessarily contradictory, uh, but it's very important to understand, uh, from, from my point of view at any rate, that a finite game is more or less harmless if it is contained within an infinite, within the infinite game. Right. Where, uh, if finite players uh, capture infinite players and f- make of them a finite uh, 
uh, enterprise or contest or something. Uh, that's not only bad, it's not only dangerous, it can even be evil. Well, uh, wouldn't that just go right back to the church killing, trying to kill all the great mystics that were heretics? Yeah, sure, sure. And actually, they're still doing it in, in uh, some traditions. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't, you know, Rumi said no man can get to God until he becomes a heretic. And I think that's one of the most profound truths anyone ever uttered. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I'd forgotten that from Rumi, but yeah, it sounds so like Rumi. Yeah. Now, a couple of questions. When we When we talk about what, you know, God in all caps, which is the mystery, but we, we'd have to say, okay, everything that is has to come from something. So we'll call that source. I refer to that as consciousness, all caps, differentiated from what you and I can hear in our heads or make heads or tails of through language or meaning. Right. But that's completely and utterly unbound. Uh, you know, if you look at it, yeah. if you think of it, like when we watch somebody who's uh, hooked up to an electroencephalogram, we can see the electrical activity of their brain going through sine waves, positives and negatives, uh, creating polarity or the flow of an electrical charge. Right. But but the flat line from which those charges emerge is really the equivalent in my model of consciousness because it's the only thing that could be aware of everything emergent from that state of neutrality. So I'm wondering with that preface, do you feel that finite games are games that we play as a means of putting a limitation on something that's infinite so that we can actually have an experience of some type and comprehend it? I think you've pretty well described it correctly. I, that's the way, that is very close to the way I see it. That's great. Yeah, you know, because I'm, I can see, you know, when you when you think about you know, if like if you, even if you look at science, okay, so now we we know that everything from quantum particles and all that is is emerging from a zero point field, but the zero point field is is one we know it's got massive amounts of energy. Uh, people like Nassim Harriman say one square one cubic centimeter of space uh, has enough energy in it to boil all the oceans on the planet. Actually, Nassim Harriman says one cubic centimeter of space has has more energy in it than all the matter in the known universe. Um, when I was at the field conference in London in about oh, 2001, um, Edgar Mitchell was the keynote speaker and Lynn McTaggart, who wrote the book, The Field, said at that time, the calculations were one cubic meter of space had enough energy to boil all the oceans in the world instantly. So it seems, you know, that there's this massive amount of energy or potential in what we think of as emptiness, but i.e. the zero point field, well, there has to be some kind of limitations or you couldn't have a star. A star has mass. It has it has uh, space. We can locate it. We can see it. Right. We can measure it. So I, my, my sort of dialogue here is just simply the reality that there has to be limitations on the mystery or there cannot, the mystery itself couldn't comprehend its own experience. Uh, right. Well, one of the peculiar characteristics of consciousness is that uh, it can't, uh, it, it, we, we, we use the term self-consciousness, uh, but the, the problem is that once you get an idea, uh, you get a picture of your consciousness, it's already uh, qualified by the fact that you were conscious when you did the picture, and your consciousness it, that you that from which you drew the picture is not in the picture. Right. So, so the, the consciousness is something we can't escape. No, it's, it's slightly analogous to uh, to one of the philosophical truisms: no one's free to give up their freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so the one thing you can't get rid of is your freedom. You're not free to do that. Uh, and and so there's a, a little bit of a, it seems like a contradiction. But the point is that um, th that we we can't find the limits and and uh, and still include within them the search for finding them. Right. It's it's a it, it's a dilemma that we have to live with, and it's part of the, the part of the mystery we've been talking about. In fact, it's not only part of it, it's, it's, it's really the seed of it. It's where 
it's where we begin to understand all these things uh, that that are, are so far beyond the limits of our knowledge that we don't uh, we we really can't capture them. That's why, by the way, I, uh, you haven't asked me this, but um, it's one of the distinctions uh, very important for me uh, in thinking about games. Uh, one of the important elements of a finite game is to have a very well-defined boundary. Uh, so you know, you know when the ball rolls over into the foul territory or something, you know, right? Or, or what you've stepped out of bounds. You've done a business deal that uh, really wasn't correct, and blah blah blah. So, uh, uh, but in a, uh, an infinite game, what you don't have is boundaries. What you have is a horizon. And a horizon is an interesting phenomenon in contrast to a boundary. A horizon, you can't, uh, you can't go out and find the end of your horizon. Because by the time you get there... There's a new horizon. A new horizon. Yeah. In fact, you can take one step and your horizon changes. Yes. In fact, one of the challenges of our lives is to take those steps and let our horizons change. And that's that's not always pleasant. Sometimes there are things over the horizon you don't want to know about. Yes, and, and uh, or will surprise you or change everything you've thought so far. It's one of the ways we all, uh, you know. I'm I'm getting to be a an old man. I'm in my ninth uh, decade. Wow, you uh, sound great, though. Well, well, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Uh, but but uh, I notice now that uh, you know the. the as my horizon changes as I age, I have a I have a different youth. I have a different childhood. I have a different I have a different career as a professional, and so on. I've been retired tired for a number of years, but but and now it doesn't look at all like it did when I retired. Uh, the, all those years I spent teaching students, and so on. Uh, so uh, the horizon, it, the, we, we the horizon is a kind of metaphor for the edge of our consciousness that we can't reach. Yes. And, and I, I like the, the term is fairly simple and easy to explain. So I, I use that uh, often enough. Well, I, I actually think it's very beautiful. And it, it, I mean, anybody even using logic can understand the concept of the horizon. And, and you know, you look at how science keeps trying to find the edges of the universe, but the bigger the telescopes, the further the horizon goes. So it totally That's fits right. reality. I mean, what you're saying to me is absolutely true. And I think going back to your point about a lot of people don't want to know what's over the horizon, as a person who does a lot of work with with uh, you know healing and, and uh, looking into people's mental emotional issues and psychological challenges, most people are deadly afraid of of their own unconscious because they've got all this repressed material down there. And so the ego doesn't want to lose its sense of control. So unfortunately the people that need it most often resist looking into themselves. In fact, some of the most challenging patients I work with in that regard are patients with heart disease. And I found there's a very consistent theme amongst them is they don't want to consider forgiving people that hurt them or look into the ways that maybe they've hurt people or the judgments that they're holding, but they are all hell bent for leather to get some kind of pill or gimmick that will take their pain away. And I, I, I think that, you know, your horizon issue is also, there's also an inner horizon, which I would call the entry into our own unconscious. Oh, sure. Sure. No, that, no, I, that, that I, 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 that's very close to my view. Well, that's fortunate because in my, as well. if my view is close to yours, I feel good because you're you're yeah. definitely somebody I have a lot of respect for. Well, thank you. So a couple of, you know, one of the things I wanted to share with you, just to sort of backtrack a touch, one of the ways I teach my students how to understand consciousness, which you, you know, kind of what you described is the empty page or the, the uh, canvas that hasn't been drawn on yet. And what we're conscious of is what we paint or what we write on the page, but the holder is, 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 is infinite. So I tell my students, just imagine if you were a dance floor in a dance hall. The dance floor here represents consciousness or that which can't be known, but is the source of all that moves or, or can be weighed or measured or conceived of. 
the dance, I, I tell them, if you were the dance floor, would there be any dance or activity that could ever happen on the floor without you knowing it? Well, everybody right. agrees. No. I uh-huh. say, well, this whole pursuit of what consciousness is, is the pursuit of what we're conscious of. And they're overlooking the fact that you cannot define consciousness, which goes right back to when people used to ask St. Francis of Assisi, how do I find God? And he would say, what you are looking for is what's looking. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, did, I don't remember that from from Francis, but as I said of uh, uh, of Rumi, it, so- it sounds like him. Yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about a finite game and we've talked about an infinite game, but could you, is there an example you could give of an infinite game that some something we could grapple with? Like we have Monopoly, well, a finite yeah. game. We have football, basketball, baseball. We have, you know, marriage, <laughs> marriage. <laughs> it's, it's got, yeah. it's got rules. Right. Um, where, what would be something if possible that you could say, okay, we can point to this as an infinite game. Well, um, <laughs> One very important thing to, to understand, and I, I realize I, I've made a little bit of a mistake here. Uh, when I, I, I was rereading a few pages in the book the other day, and I realized in the book I talk about, I, I will refer to something called an infinite game mm-hmm. or an infinite player and so on. But in fact, the, the last, as, as you probably know the last line in the book is there is only one infinite game and the reason for that is if there was another infinite game it's not yet infinite it's the same principle we're talking about right exactly so it's only when all the players are playing the same game which we call an infinite game uh, uh that we can call it an infinite game, but so, so therefore, it's something very, very unlikely to happen. Uh, you know, it's, there, there are. I, I can't even imagine how it might happen that everyone would get together and play the infinite game. Uh, it, it, I, I wish it could. I, I, of course, it's my 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 deepest wish. But on the other hand, there are for human uh, forms of human uh, activity and human uh, community and so on that function more like an infinite game, the infinite game, uh, than they do, say, a finite game. And so, when people ask me for an example, the the only thing I can I can really give that makes sense, but you have to think about it very carefully, uh, is uh, the the great religions. And think about that for a moment. Uh, Hinduism has been around for about four thousand years. Uh, you know, the beginning, the beginning, the date, the, the dates of these religions are you know pretty iffy. But uh, in Buddhism, probably uh, twenty six hundred years. Uh, uh, Judaism, you could go, you could go back four thousand years for Judaism, but it's more likely to start with the. Uh, the the Roman destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year seventy. So let's say two thousand years for Judaism, uh, and for Christianity two thousand years for Islam uh, sixteen hundred years. So th- these are long long term uh, associations. Now, now wh- what makes this fascinating to me as a historian of religion is that there are there are striking exa- world examples historical examples where religions overlap. I mean, for example, Buddhists and Hindus overlapped in uh, India for about a thousand years. They used each other's languages. They used each other's images and so on. But almost never was anyone confused about whether he or she was a Buddhist or a Hindu. Uh, The same thing applies to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, Those three religions... uh, uh, coexisted very nicely, a little tension, but but more or less amicably uh, in the uh, in the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, mostly uh, in Spain and Italy, uh, so and nor- and Northern Africa also. 
so uh, what, what, what fascinates me is that in that era, uh, from let's say about a thousand, the year nine hundred to uh, well, Islam Islam filled the the uh, the Western world uh, within a century, around seven hundred. So, so let's say uh, there were plenty of Jews and Christians around. So for four or five centuries, uh, these three great religions uh, overlapped with each other. Uh, and in some cases, like, for example, the, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, mm-hmm. a Jew spoke Arabic. He wrote in Arabic. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and then the, uh, a lot of the Christians understood, understood Arabic. And, of course, a lot of the Arabs, uh, Arabs were completely literate in Greek and Latin. And, and they, they knew each other's religions very well. But the striking thing is not that, not that, but that they never lost the religion. They never were confused about what it is, uh, what their religion is and what, what it isn't. And what that says to me is that there is something in their religion that, uh, that, that could not answer their questions, but it also could not allow them to stop asking those questions. There's, there's a core. Uh, in each of these religions that that kept them together an identity and but to name that identity uh, to give it uh, a, a locus was never uh was never really possible uh, and we, we see it very easily let's say in the uh in the teachings of, or the figure of jesus uh, very, jesus lived we know about jesus for about a year uh, he was a, a young young man. He was probably in, in his uh, might be 30, 31. We were not sure. Uh, uh, he was not. He was probably illiterate. He couldn't write. Uh, we're not sure he could read. Uh, the um, uh, he spoke uh, uh, Aramaic, not Hebrew. Right. He could probably understand Hebrew. Uh, he probably understood Greek too, because. In that in that uh, area, there were there were a lot of Greek uh, cultural uh, and and Latin uh, presences. So we're we're talking about a very limited human being. But but if we ask what that life was about, the libraries of the world are filled with books about who Jesus was. Right. Not, not one perfectly agreeing with another. No. Nope. But the supply continues to grow. <laughs> you referred to Johnson's book on Jesus. Yes. You know, he tried to answer that question. Uh, lot, uh, uh, one writer after another tries to answer that question, who Jesus was. You can't do it, but you also can't give up the question. So there's something at the center of each of these religions that keeps them going. And I think that's, that tells us something about an infinite game, that at the core of it, there's a mystery that binds. There's a there's an unknown that that defies our our deepest and best uh, inquiries, uh, but yet attracts them, and and I that's why I don't think there's such a thing as one religion for the whole world. I think there are multi, multiple religions, uh, but uh, but they but their distinctiveness to me is a very very interesting fact. So yes. that's as close as I can come to describing anything. Uh, as well, I, I really appreciate it. I think it's beautiful because what it does is it does not try to encapsulate the mystery. So it it leaves the necessary emptiness, which draws one forward. And without that emptiness, you know, and this is really a big part of what I got from your religious case against belief is, is that. Whenever you contrive that you've brought something to a conclusion, to quote Nietzsche, you kill God. You turn a, s- a symbol into a sign, mm-hmm. and that, and then the death of that philosophy or, or way of relating it, it happens. And I think that's really a big part of the problem with religion today. Is that it's it's all um, so many people that are taught these things are taught them as actual fact, as opposed to right, right. being ways that other people have engaged the mystery so, you know like the gnostics were very into sharing their experiences as opposed to defining whether you were right or wrong and i think we've lost that one of the thoughts that came up as i was listening to you is 
you know, people, as you know, have this sort of like fervor about Jesus and all the things he supposedly said and did. And as you just mentioned, there's a million books that are contradictory to each other. But one of the things that I point out to Christians, because I find constantly at the back of a lot of diseases, beliefs that track right back to religious programming. And I tell them, you know, you're using this word, these words, Jesus Christ, but you don't understand the word Christ. So I have a beautiful book in my library uh, called the, um, it's by Charles Fillmore. It's the metaphysical Christian dictionary. And in the definition of Christ, he says, the word Christ is not a name. It is a title. It means one with all. So the point I make is when Christians keep saying, oh, Jesus is going to come back. I say, wait a minute. You have to miss. You've misunderstood the title. Jesus does not have Christ. If he had a driver's license, it would not say Jesus Christ on it. It would be like, be like saying Jesus CEO or something. Uh-huh. But the word Christ, meaning one with all, means Jesus, by definition, philosophically, is one with all. He's always here and always will be here and always is here, which really means one with consciousness or source itself. So mm-hmm. there, therein lies the mystery. You know, and so we could we could sort of in metaphor say that the title Christ means the mi- the mystery will continue. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, the uh, in my in that book, the religious case against belief, I, I refer to uh, a former professor of mine, Yaroslav Pelikan, uh, who uh, published a book called a, a series of books called the Major. Creeds of Christendom. It's a five-volume, uh, twenty-pound, thirty-pound <laughs> uh, bit of writing. Now, now think about it. I, I don't know how many creeds are in there, but hundreds of them. And not one creed, Christian creed, like the like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and so on. Not one agrees with another. So. It, 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 you take that whole volume of what it says to you, Christians have not yet figured out what they believe. No, and, I agree. And what what and if they recognize that, if they still don't know what it's about, uh, it would be a much more powerful and interesting religion, I, I think. I do. Uh, I agree 100 percent. You know, I don't yeah. know who who this quote comes from, but you triggered me to share it. Never judge a man by the creed he professes, but by the life he leads. And when sure. you look at the history of uh, of the Crusades and all the warring between the Muslims and the Christians, I mean, there's so much warring in all the religions. I've studied this quite a bit, but all that warring really boils down to um, <laughs> unconscious finite games and ignorance of the infinite game, don't you think? Oh, well, of course, of course. Right. And, um, now... My next question, we've kind of addressed, but I'll state it again um, just to see if there's another angle you want to take it. Can one be in an infinite game and a finite game player at the same time? Oh, oh sure, sure. Uh, I, you, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to finite games. I think they're they're part of the the sauce, the the chemistry, the the sizzle of life. You know, they're they're often great fun. They're challenging. They're they're uh, they can be enormously creative and, and all of that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I was a college athlete. I even, I, I earned my, I made my way through college with athletic scholarships. I'd be the last person to, uh, uh, you know, uh, laugh off a finite games or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, they can become obsessive. They can become negative. They can become uh, destructive. Uh, but but they they are not by definition by their by their by their character anti infinite play right you as long as they're included in a in a much longer uh, uh, enterprise uh, you, you know as, as something we're, we're talking about a lot here with an open end a horizontal uh, a horizontal edge. Uh, they're they're for the most part not only harmless but they might even be good. You know, I I have a couple of comments I'll share with you on that and with the audience. Um, one, I think that if 
people were more conscious of the concept of the infinite game, then they wouldn't beat themselves up so badly about their performance or lack of performance in finite games. Because instead of perceiving oneself as a loser, they would potentially perceive themselves as a learner. And, you know, when I used to be a, a fighter, I was a boxer and a kickboxer and a motocross racer and lots of other sports. But when I, when I was a fighter, I used to, people used to say to me, aren't you afraid to lose? And I would say, I train so hard and I am so focused. The first person I want to hug and congratulate is anyone that can beat me. And so I always saw the guys that beat me as my teachers and I would study them and learn from them. In other words, I didn't go into a state of poor me or guilt and shame or self-denial. I just said, wow, I've met my next teacher and, and I'm grateful. And so that gave me this inspiration to keep growing myself and doing better. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you look at the fact, you know, um, one of my favorite definitions of consciousness is by a uh, Jungian analyst and psychiatrist, Edward Edinger. He says, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. So it, as I am re reading your book over and over again, what came to me is that finite games are actually essential for the development of consciousness, for the growth of knowledge, for the growth of awareness, for perpetual experience. Because if we did not, you know, for example, if there was no lines on a football field, well, the game would run over the whole town and someone could, how would you know when you had a touchdown? It would just, it would just, it would be meaningless. Uh -huh. So it seems to me like what I, what I kind of intuitively read from your book is that finite games are actually tools for growing conscious awareness. Oh, well, I wouldn't have uh, said that myself, but I don't agree. With, uh, d don't disagree with it. No, I, th I think that's right. I, I, uh, I think there are, there are many positive values for uh, finite games. I don't think you could live a life without, without playing a great number of them. Well, you certainly wouldn't be in a relationship without them. <laughs> no, that, no, that's right. You wouldn't. That's, <laughs> that's one way, right? And depending on what you say before you say "I do," there's your there's the beginning of a game. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, there are, many, there are many finite elements of intimate relationships. That's right. Uh, and um, you know, who am I to talk? I've 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 gone through. I don't know, God knows how many competitions with degrees and and uh, positions and titles and so on. Uh, so and uh, uh, the in in a way I've been a winner many times, a loser also a number of times. But uh, but when I look back at my life, I think yeah, well that that was part of it. It was part of the of the thrill of being alive, and being alive is a thrill and should it be is. So, yeah. It is. And, and I think I think because people have fallen into this scientific materialist trap of of sort of thinking that they know what's going on or, you know, being limited, like people have their nose so close to the ground, they can't grasp the bigger picture, the mystery, the the sort of excitement of not knowing what tomorrow brings or you know, you, you can be a champion athlete, but you, you don't know you're going to be the champion in your next game or your next uh, championship. Right. So there's, there's a perpetual drawing force. It's, it's as though the soul craves more of the experience of what mm -hmm. it ultimately is, which is that, in my opinion, which is unconditional or source but it can only really realize what it is when it fills itself with everything that it isn't. In other words, I don't think we can really truly appreciate the infinite until we have put ourselves through enough of the finite to create enough pain and enough awareness or to, to, to realize that the positive path is a long path, but there's a certain point at which the accumulation of more do's, don'ts, should, shouldn'ts, and so-called knowledge ultimately leads us to deeper and deeper questions to where we end up just stopping thinking 
and all of a sudden the negativa opens the door to the mystery. Yeah, that's well put. Uh, I, I like that, Paul. That's good. Nicely put. Thank you. James, in section two, subheading 32 of Finite and Infinite Games, you state, as we shall see, this ceaseless change does not mean discontinuity. Rather, change itself is the very basis of our continuity as persons. Only that which can change can continue. This is the principle by which infinite players live. What inspired me to ask you, uh, you know, what I'm inspired to ask you based on the statement, I've, I've got a few things here. So my first one, sure. are the games we play with each other essentially all learning tools? Oh, oh yeah, of course. And if yes, then what do you think the ultimate lesson we're here to learn is? Well, I'm not sure about that. I th the way I approach that, the issue of learning, is to see it as uh, an opening process that, that always redefines its own goals. So uh, you, you, you say, I've got to understand what is going on in this particular situation. Right. And then you, you, you reach a certain kind of understanding, and then you, then you want to question why you, why you wanted to understand that. And, and so you've got an, another kind of exploration to, uh, to take on. And so, so for me, a goal uh, of, of our learning, of our searching, uh, is to uh, constantly aim toward a goal which we then find worthy or you know once we get there uh to uh, uh to go beyond it so that in in a way it's it's an infinite process it doesn't have it has no end it's it's again to use the term it's horizontal you you get to the horizon you want to see what's on the edge over there as far as you can see well you get there and then you look, or whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not at all what I had in mind, what's out there. And so you you look again, you go further, you take another, you take another leg on that hike, and uh it, it gets another, you have another vision and so on. Uh and and I I think that's one of the magic most magical things about being human. You know, as you're talking, you reminded me of one of my favorite definitions of God. I'll share it with you because it makes a point that I'm going to bring in here. God is a sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. And, oh, the point, yeah. and the point would be then, no matter where you're at, you're facing a horizon. Of course, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, yeah. as a therapist working with all sorts of addictions, illnesses, diseases, and orthopedic challenges... I've seen over and over again that when people are unwilling to change, they can't learn and are often unable to heal until the pain is great enough that they're willing to reach outside their program beliefs and behaviors or find inspiration to change from an internal or external source, either one. That shared, would you agree that when we play the same games repeatedly without realizing that we're producing the same results, imbalances in our body, mind, and spirit, um, or the complex mirror of the psyche. In, the, in other words, what I'm saying is when we play yeah. the same games over and over again, expecting the same results, if the underlying principle is the never-ending horizon or constant and perpetual growth, aren't we really setting ourselves up for pain? Oh, well, uh, if well, well, there are a couple things here. If you play the finite, finite game, the same game over and over again, uh, it's, it, here, here we get to an interesting problem. If you play the same game again, it's not exactly the same game. It's uh, it, by repeating it, you've got another, it, it, even though the, it may look the same, it may feel the same and so on, but you've gone, you've you've gone somewhere ahead in time. You you may even have gone to a different place, uh, and there are differences in each repetition. 
that are often too subtle for most people, uh, for many people to uh, to perceive. And uh, what I what I would say is that uh, a repetition of a game is a kind of process we put ourselves into uh, that will um, uh, that will guarantee in some way that we don't ever have a horizon. And yet, uh, we, our, our lives are changing along the way, but there's a limit to the amount of change we can take. It's right. not as though we're the same every day, every day, every day. Every day we do the same thing. We're slightly different. But, but uh, if th- these repetitions, these obsessions, are, you know, even neuroses, uh, are uh, are in this in each expression a little bit different, but in their sum, keep us from being horizontal human beings. Well, wouldn't it be safe to say then that one source of neuroses is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? Uh, oh well, that you, I would say that yeah, that you're going to get better if you do it again, sort of thing. Uh, you know, sure. Yeah. One of the, the the sort of to sort of help encapsulate what I was referring to when I say playing the same finite game over and over again, I think is from my experience coaching countless people with relationship trouble and finding relationship trouble at the source of diseases like cancer yeah. is the concept of conditional love, which I encapsulate with these statements. I love you if you do such and such. I love you when you do such and such. And I love you, but, and then there's a counter argument. And typically the word, but means forget everything, forget everything I said up till now. (laughs) And so, you know, what I see happening to people is they keep expecting other people to make them happy or other people to make them feel beautiful or good. And that's the kind of finite game if it's played repeatedly with the same expectations, I believe really leads to, um, you know, uh, as a metaphor, death of the soul. Oh, I, I I agree. I think that's right. That's that's. I think that's correct. I see it the same way. Anyway, I mean, whether it's, uh, I mean, I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. In, in, yeah. Yeah. In subsection thirty three, you explain the issue of politics and the difference between how infinite and finite players engage politics, based on your descriptions. I'd classify myself as an infinite player in this context. Can you please give us an overview of politics and how the infinite and finite players engage the political process? Well, I make I I don't I'm not sure I said this in the book, but my own view is that uh, a, a finite player has a politics. An infinite player is political. I see. A, uh, to have a politics is to have an ideology, a fixed view, uh, very clear, usually clear, sometimes fo- foggy, though, uh, uh, idea of the way society should be, the way we should respond and uh, act with each other and so on. Uh, but to, to be political is to have an understanding that, uh, that we all live in, uh, in, a, in a society together. We are there's there's no way we can live alone with uh, neighbors surrounding us and people working with us and so on. So we we need to be we need need to be discerning. We need to be careful. We need to be sensitive. We need to learn how uh, what's happening, uh, how it happens, why it happens, and so on. And that's what I call political. When I think about it, the way a group works. Right. So um, uh, I. Uh, I, I, I think I think being political is absolutely crucial uh, to to being an infinite player. You can have a politics, but it, it but if it falls un, falls into your if it falls under the category of being political, your politics may not be uh, may may be subject to a lot of changes. Right, uh, you know, a couple of things that brings up in me. If we take that same concept you're describing as. Uh, political and uh, versus politics uh, or the infinite versus the finite view, it seems to me that the same thing shows up in fundamental fundamentalism versus mysticism. Yeah, I think that's that's pro- approximately correct. Yeah. On the one hand, you have uh, 
a rules oriented. You ha you have an ideology. You have a a, an, a, a, a politics um, and uh, a resistance to being political about the politics and so on. Right. Yeah. Joseph uh, Campbell says when a, whenever a religion takes its connotations as dictations, it is in deep trouble. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In um, in section three, I am the genius of myself, which is, is another profound. All of these chapters are profound. I keep repeating that, but it's true. I found the section of finite and infinite games very fascinating. Um, I re it reminded me of the Greek concept of the soul as the genius within. Um, though I could list many amazing mind puzzling paradoxical statements from this section of your book, I thought it would be best to ask you, can you define genius as you use it in the book? And can you share how the concept of genius relates to what is traditionally held as the concept of one's soul? Right. Well, the, the, uh, by, by, you know, I'm, I'm a, among other things, a scholar of Greek, the Greek language. Right. And the the word genius comes from the the, uh, the word meaning uh, origin or source. We we trans you know we know it in words like genetic genesis, uh, in g even the word gene, uh, and it, it means the source, the egg, the seed uh, from which things begin. Now that's that's a very important thing for me because that that beginning. That as I, I I use the word genius in that in a kind of an old fashioned way, not having to do with intelligence, but having to do with with the origin of the self. Uh, we are we are our own. I don't want to. Th it sounds a little grand to say we are our own creators. That's 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 too large a statement. But to be the genius of all that we do means to be we're ultimately responsible for everything we do. Everything we do, we do by choice. Right. Even if we play a finite game, we play freely. And that's an important element here, by the way. A lot of people have the feeling that they're caught uh, in, in games of certain kinds. You've got a job. You have to finish it. You have to uh, do this by Friday, da 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 and so on. And the rules are very clear, and the, the punishment is severe, and so on. Uh, and you might have the feeling uh, that you have to do this. The truth is, because you're the genius of yourself, you don't have to do it. You have chosen to do it. Right. So think about that. Think about what you have chosen to do. Uh, and th therefore, that's what I said a little, little glibly a little bit earlier, uh, that you, you're not free to give up your own freedom. I mean, it's the same kind of principle at work here. Uh, but it, but it has, it has a, a lot of deeper meanings. For example, Let's say you you have uh, and I, I I was I was talking with a friend the other day I hadn't seen for a number of years, uh, and it turns out that his politics have gone way in a different direction from mine. Uh, I mean his his political commitments and and conceptions, and so I was thinking now wait a minute uh, I do have a, a kind of a politics and he has one, uh, and I was thinking how free am I to change mine, how free is he, how freely has he been taking up his views, which I find really quite uh, troubling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he will tell you, this, this, this fellow, that he didn't decide to do these things. This is the way it is. And, and I would like to explain to him, no, it may be the way it is, but you decided to see it that way. So look at that original decision. That's your genius. Your genius is not being able to figure it out. Your genius is that you, to be able to develop a view altogether. And so I was questioning myself, too, in that, in that exchange. How much of a genius am I of my own uh, uh, political and intellectual and, and uh, religious views and so on? Uh, and th th those, are, those are big questions. Uh, that's why I would say, for example, uh, a people when a people gets together to create uh, a society, they may feel that they have all kinds of of uh, 
power relationships within that society that are structured, that are established by rules, by norms, by procedures, by administrative relationships, and so on. The truth is, everyone does this freely. Uh, and to tell you another thing that's another way of putting it, um, we may some we may say you're free to be an American or not be an American. If you want to be a Canadian, go ahead or whatever. But are we free to be American? That's different. Yes. So to choose to be America is very different than choose to be an American. When we choose to be America, then we have all the things that we, that the, what comes from us is all of what later seems to be fixed and finished. Well, it's not because it came from our own genius, our own freedom, our own creativity, our imagination, our initiative. And, uh, and short of that, it doesn't exist. And it right. continues to do that. Uh, so, so th- th- if you if you look at yourself as the genius of your actions, that wh- what you're doing is taking a very deep responsibility for the way in which you conduct your life. Which, which really, to me, is the territory of of being an adult, isn't it? Oh, ab- absolutely. You, you you can't you can't grow up without that. You know. Um, so, how do you feel? Because you know, um, I've read James Hollis's book on the soul and I've read over 120 books on the soul and they're at like religion. There's very little, uh, correlating understanding of the soul. I've certainly done my own investigations, but how, and, and I've read books of Greek philosophy core where, where authors correlate the concept of genius with the soul. And James Hollis, I believe is one of them. You know, if the genius is the source and the soul I would define as consciousness within. Ultimately, it's hard for me to distinguish genius from soul. Do you have any comments on that? Well, uh, yeah, my, my comments would be mostly, uh, in this case, let's say historical or, or linguistic. Uh, I, the, um, um, the, the, the word psyche or the, the word from which we translate uh, yes. Th- what we mostly have in mind is psyche, the Greek word for soul. Right. Or the Greek word we translate as soul. But it's also interesting that the, the Romans, the, uh, the Latin translation of psyche is anima. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Jung uses that term frequently. Yeah. Which, which, indi- which indicates that, um, th- th- which, which focuses on the way we animate ourselves. Yes, the way we uh, and that's what I'm what I'm getting at when I say a genius that we we are our own the source of our own life in a sense we right. am, we spring into action we uh, we do things we have initiative and so on um, and that's I think that that part of our of our being is a little bit better understood f- from the Latin point of view than from the Greek point of view now now on the other hand. Uh, I'm I'm perfectly familiar with, uh, with uh, of course you know I I know the Greek philosophers quite well I think, but uh, but and and once you get into the Greek philosophers, uh, you have a lot of different uh, uh, conceptions of uh, of the soul, and I think Plato might in the end uh, be the richest of those uh, when when he points out that. Uh, you can't distinguish what what we're now you, you and I are now calling the soul from what he called uh, idea and form uh, forma and and mor- mor- uh, morphe I'm sorry and so uh, forma is the Latin and morphe is the Greek so uh, the 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 soul. Or actually, he used also used the word mind, nous, n o u s, uh, for uh, for what he was talking about. Um, is for him uh, a, a, a timeless, boundless um, uh, entity at the center of our existence that has neither beginning nor end. 
Now, of course, he wants to, to uh, he does at least uh, in, uh, in some of his uh, dialogues, he uses that notion to uh, underscore, to develop a theory of immortality. That is, if the soul exists before us, it will exist after us. Uh, I, I would rather say uh, that there is this animating center uh, in us that shares with everything that's gone before and with everything that comes after. It's not as if we're going to survive our death. Our, our, what we're going to do is in, live more and more deeply up to the time of our death. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's, that's the way I conceive of the soul as, a, as the deep learning initiative animating center of our existence, which we cannot get close enough to name except by way of being animated to do it. You know, we're, right. back, we're back in that wonderful circle of, of consciousness of being conscious of itself. You know, uh, one, oh, sorry, did you want to say more? No, no, that's good. That's enough. Uh, you know, one of my favorite philosophers is Plotinus. I'm, I suspect oh, you're- yeah, of course. Right. You know, I, I love Plotinus. He defines the soul as having three qualities, which are to abide, to reflect, and to represent. So when we're talking about the genius in the language that you're using yeah. in your book, I could not help but reflect on the concept that if the genius is what is responsible for knowing or making the choices or uh, ultimately w- what everything's emerging from, then then we have to say, well, the genius abides within us, within us but the process of reflection and representation are really the qualities of thinking and acting. Yeah, but they have to be initiated also. Well, so, isn't isn't abiding though uh, in the metaphysical sense? Well, yeah. Well, maybe uh, the one thing about Plotinus, uh, I, I don't know the text here, uh, but I know that he uh, he was he was probably speaking in Greek. Uh, I'm not sure. The text, the original text, is in uh, Latin or Greek. I've kind of forgotten. I think it's in Greek, but uh, but in any case, he may be talking. He may be using the word mind, nous. Okay. Uh, yes. Those are features of because what he's describing are features of thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the nous has a deeper origin. He he would not. Uh, he would he he would def, most definitely not. Uh, put his finger on the thing that is the center of our existence, uh, because he knows even to point is already, uh, you, you know, an, an animating, an animated activity that can't point back to itself. I mean, well, he, yeah, he refer and in, in, and I've studied him quite a bit, and I can actually uh, email you the title of the book. It's that I that I got this particular stuff out of. It's a it's a hardback. Uh, quite a nice book, which is really a focus on Plotinus's teachings on the soul, if I remember right. It's been a number of years since I read it. But Plotinus really referred back to source as the one and well, stated- the one, the one ha, ha hen, he called it the, in Greek. The, the yeah. one, yeah, the one, right. Which he said, it's important to realize that the vacuum is simultaneously a plenum because he was making the point right. that that the source is not empty, it's equally full of everything, which interestingly correlates exactly to the findings of uh, quantum physics in the zero-point field. Oh, well, yeah, I, I don't know that, but it sounds right. Well, uh, so this has been very, very exciting. You know, we, we've we've covered a lot of great stuff. I, I, I would love to dive into these last couple of questions for you, uh, with you. In section four, a finite game occurs within a world. Um, as with all the sections of your book, this one too is loaded with deep concepts that can send one down a rabbit hole of deep reflection. So I would love it, James, if you can share definition or definitions of a world to begin with, and then elaborate on your statements on page 89, where you say the fact that it must be limited temporally numerically and spatially means that there is something against which the limits stand. There is an outside to every finite game. The limits are meaningless unless there is something to be limited, unless there is a larger space or a longer time 
or a greater number of possible competitors. Right. Uh, so can you start by sharing what a world is and then elaborate on that statement, if you don't mind? Sure. Uh, well, by, <clears throat> uh, well, to take that statement, what, uh, what if playing within boundaries, uh, and th those boundaries are very, very important to keep. Or once you, once you, uh, once the boundaries become vague, the game won't work. So, you know, they, right. Everyone has to agree on these boundaries. You won't know what the game is, actually. You won't know what the game is. That's exactly right. Uh, so, uh, they're, 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 they need to, to protect those boundaries from within. But a boundary is also a separation between an inside and the outside. So there has to be an outside or the boundary doesn't make any sense. It can't include everything. So it has to be an exclusion as well as an inclusion. Now, now the question is, what kind of an ex what, what's being excluded? Well, what's being excluded is everyone who's not playing. Uh, and who's not playing? Well, there, there, now there are categories of things. Uh, for, for one thing, uh, the people closest to the boundaries also have an interest to keep those boundaries there. Otherwise, they would wander onto the field, if you understand what I'm saying. Sure, yeah, just like they happens in football games when that. people go crazy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, that's right. So, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while it happens in a in a baseball game or something, some, uh, you know, s some drunk uh, fan stumbles onto the field and ruins the game so or a hockey or a hockey game when the crowd gets involved in the fights on the ice oh yeah that's right yeah that kind of thing right so so uh, anyway the, i i wanted a term for that that outside of the boundaries and what what occurred to me is of course it's an audience right so these are the these are the people who listen to and watch what's happening across the boundary and it's very important for them to make sure that these boundaries are clear for them too, as well as for the players, uh, they so they won't be confused. Now, a world. Uh, the the for me the, uh, the use of the term world uh, also means something uh, aware, sensitive to, a bounding, the bounding of. Uh, our own uh, individual situation and so on. What's out? The world is what's outside us. So the world has an interest too in keeping that that boundary clear. Uh, if the world swallows us up, it swallows us up, uh, swallows us up. There's neither world nor player uh, in that case. All the distinctions are gone. So the the world is. Uh, is it very hard to define boundary or surrounding within which uh, we conduct our lives, mostly our, our, our finite games? Now, in an infinite game, the infinite player will know, will be aware that that's the function of a world. And that's why one philosopher, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, made uh, a most uh, stunning remark that you won't, you, won't, you won't understand outside this, the kind of conversation we're having. When he said, a world, worlds, uh, die Welt, Welt in German, the world, worlds. And, and uh, what he meant was it makes itself up in order for what it's viewing, what it's surrounding, what, it's, what the edges it's creating remain effective. So uh, that means you'll have, depending on the game you're in, you may have a different world. If you, if you, once you, uh, if you, in college, you played on the volleyball team, you have a certain audience. If you graduate and get your MBA, and go into business, you have another set, you have a different kind of audience and so on. You're in a different world. Uh, and so our worlds change uh, as, as we go, uh, as we go along. And they change in relation to the finite games we're playing. Each finite game has, uh, has a certain kind of defining uh, quality, a defining power for what the world is that surrounds it. So we talk about the world of basketball, the world of business, right. uh, the, world, you know, the world of this and the world of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like an animated and effective and self-conscious audience. So in essence, there's worlds potentially within worlds. 
Oh, multiple worlds. Are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner's teachings at all? Uh, yes, I am. I am. Uh, yeah, I've studied him for uh, at least 25 years. I've got a, about 170 of his books here in my library. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, no, the I know, reason I know the Waldorf schools and I know I I I've, I've actually been I spent a lot of time in Germany in my life and uh I've been around I I've never specific I mean I've read Steiner but I've never specifically studied him or uh, gone to been involved in any of the institutions. Yeah, I've studied him quite extensively, and and I have woven some of the key concepts of his teachings into the entire philosophy and and underpinnings of my institute. But why I'm bringing this up is because when you're defining a world and the importance of the audience being outside the boundary and the players inside the boundary, what came into my mind like a flash intuition was Steiner's description of a soul Steiner said, anything that has an inside and an outside has a soul. So to me, based on Steiner's conception, you've just described the soul of a game. Oh, that's that's good. Yes. yes I think you're right. That sounds right. And yeah. you know, the in alchemy, the soul is described as the feminine aspect, the receptive aspect, that which right. has memory and experiences itself. But the spirit is the flow of the energy and information that animates the soul. And the analogy given in one of my great alchemy books to help people understand that is they to say back in the olden days when, when royalty used to seal envelopes with wax seals, they would take a stamp and put it into hot wax. And they said that the wax itself is like the soul and the stamp is the spirit and the two have no function or meaning without each other. Uh, yeah, all right. Sounds... So it seems like the spirit of the game is the flow of the activity, that which animates it, and the soul is, A, the players inside the boundaries having their experience, and just like somebody else's soul can be eating chocolate cake and may not have the same inner experience as you, as you for example, I used to be a race car driver. I was a stock car racer and a drag racer. And it used to upset me when I would race stock cars because everybody loved it when the drivers crashed. And <laughs> as a as a stock car racer, I'm like, you have no idea how expensive that is and how uh, you know traumatic it can be to the drivers. And so I used to kind of get a bit irritated. Now, you know, sitting in the stands, yeah, a crash is kind of exciting. But the point that I'm making is that the drivers, we'll call them the players of the game, are having a very different experience as far as the the intention or the perspective of what's going on from the spectators. And therefore, you could say that there's a soul inside the game and there's other souls witnessing the game, both of which it seems to take to create a world. Yeah, that's that's right. I, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't have... Uh... You know, chose those examples, but I but they work. Well, you know, I, I that's what makes the the world beautiful is because we can have a bunch of very intelligent people. You know, there's an old Buddhist saying: if you put twelve enlightened people at a round table with a multicolored bouquet of flowers in the middle of the table, if you ask them what they're seeing, even though they're enlightened, they will all give you twelve different descriptions. Well, that's right. And so the person on one side of the table can't see the black flower and the other person on the black side can't see the white flower. So this is really what my podcast is all about. I love to find people like you that really have a depth of wisdom to inspire the rest of us to see the world in ways that maybe we've never seen it before. And so I enjoy talking to you because you're triggering off all sorts of things that I've studied that are importing themselves into perspectives that I can now only experience because of what you've shared with me through your writings. Well, uh, that's quite reassuring. That's quite no, it's incredible. Well, I, I, you're a yeah. very good writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, um, is it before we move on to? Uh, my favorite section, myth. Is there anything that you feel like you'd like to share in regard to the issue of the world? 
Uh, no, th that's that's it. But um, the I um, I have a lot more I'd want to say about it. But it, it, it but we've we've pretty well pretty well uh, got the idea down. But but I, well, well, we did. think of the world as uh, necessary to finite play, right? Uh, those, the, the, and and. And that that, it's, that there's a there's an interesting contrast between the two. I think we've we're on on our way to reflecting more deeply. Yes, thank it. you. I, I'm 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 grateful for these explanations. In in um, section or chapter seven, titled "Myth Provokes Explanation but Accepts None of It," <laughs> just that title alone is deep. Um. As fascinating and as fascinating and deep as your whole book is, this chapter it, it just made my heart and mind embrace themselves and dance wildly. <laughs> um, being that the topic is big enough to do an entire series of podcasts, I'm going to narrow my questions down to a few that I feel are essential to address for the benefit of the listeners. First of all, how would you define a myth? Well, a myth is uh, a story that refuses to be uh, anything other than a story. So once you've, you've told the story, uh, it can't be explained. Uh, the story itself stands independent of all of its explanations, but still demands it. Uh, and a, a myth, a myth is a, a myth is something that can't be, uh, interpreted in such a way that the interpretation replaces the myth. Right. Uh, I, you, you know, in other words, you, you could say, uh, you know, people very often say, oh, you're, you're reading a novel. I said, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm reading a novel. What's it about? Well, if I could tell you what the novel's about uh, accurately, it, what I'm telling you could replace the novel. Right, but that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So, so a, a story, a good story, a great story, is one that 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 presses you to say what it's about, but then uh, doesn't allow you to get away with it completely. Uh, the the uh, uh, but it, it may raise questions and lead you to other insights. Uh, that are not necessarily in contradiction to it. It can be a very creative presence in a in a life. I mean, a, a good example, of course, is uh, is Freud. Freud uh, is often uh, um, kind of maligned as being a, a bad scientist. And, a, and he, if you think of him as a scientist, he probably was a bad scientist. But Freud, Freud was not. Freud was a poet. He was a mythologist. He told stories that made uh, that made us look very differently at our lives, uh, and all of his all of his great ideas come from come from myths, not from science, uh, not from philosophy even, uh, but but the the deeper and ancient stories. Uh, even the way he understood Judaism uh, comes from uh, Egyptian myth and, and history and story and so on. So um, and and. and, and he he was a Jew himself, but that, but he used a myth to explain how he how he uh, understood his own Judaism. Um, that's that's a beginning of the the way myths work. I mean, that's enough to say to be to begin it. Yeah, I, I I love it. Now you know one of the things that I must admit irritates me is when you get all these so called scholarly breakdowns of myth and saying that, oh, they're not factual, you know, looking at the Bible, the world wasn't produced in four days. But to me, that is, is, it's just really sort of a glowing neon light that says you don't even know what a myth is. So how could you possibly analyze it from right. a, a rational perspective? Because to me, it means you already admitted you're not qualified to work with myth. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I've I've run into that many times. That's that's uh, yeah. The temptation is very strong to, because a myth is is a kind a, a good myth is a story you can't forget. 
And if yes. you can't forget it, it becomes annoying. You want to find out, in, in a way, you want to analyze it to get it out of your attention. If you explain it, you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. I see. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. A good, a good myth keeps keeps working at you. Uh, yes. Deeply and, and disturbing you. One of the ways I like to talk about that is to say that <clears throat> uh, when you tell a story, any story, it's not oh, there's not only the story you're telling, there's a story of the telling that you're telling. In other words, uh, I mean, I, I, I grew up in a family of, of uh, anecdotalists. Uh -huh. And every, we, we sat around the table uh, hours and hours every night telling stories. And, and what was more interesting to me was the story behind the story that was told. Uh, even as a child, I wondered, why did that, what's the story of that guy telling that story and so on? And that, but, but that event as a child, for me, is a story. I'm telling it right now, you know, that it was, it was, it was a larger, it belonged to a larger story, namely being in a family that, and so on. Uh, now, uh, how do I interpret that? Well, uh, uh, it, it, it would take me a lifetime to interpret all of that. But, but the, 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 a, a great myth, a true myth is a story that, that will lead to an infinite, essentially infinite number of other stories. It's a story that creates storytellers as well as explanations. I don't think I stress that maybe enough in the book, but I, this is one thing I'm, I'm very convinced of. That when you, the, 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 the most powerful effect a story has is to make its reader a storyteller. Right. Not tell that story, but tell their own. And yes. that's when stories are the most powerful. And that's why myths are uh, extremely powerful and important in our, in our civilization, even in our psychology, our personal lives. Yes. It, you bringing up some interesting uh, reflections inside of me as you're saying that when you describe the fact that the myth inspires the story to tell, the story inspires you to tell the story. And you were describing how when you were a kid sitting at the table, you you know, you were looking behind it. It seems to me that if you go behind the story, you're going to run smack dab into archetypes, aren't you? Um, well, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure I, what I think about archetypes. Uh, because an archetype, after all, does, to a, do, does do a kind of limitation on the, uh, on the myth. And uh, I think a myth always, you know, it may point to uh, an archetype, but the but it, the, the deeper the deeper myth probably slips away from it, uh, and um, someone else might look at it with with great originality, and not see an archetype in it. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm just referring to the primordial ideas that ultimately give us uh, a basis for meaning. For example, the archetype of the mother and the archetype of the father. Oh well, those those are yeah, those are. Uh, I know they work. They work powerfully in a in a culture. That's true. They're yeah. not always identical. I mean, a, a mother in one culture will be a, a different from the, the archetype of mother in another. Of course. Yeah, but, that's that's why Jung says archetypes are empty forms. You fill the content. He he says. Uh, yeah, that's, for, that's, that's a nice point. Yeah, he says. For example, if you think of archetypes as fingerprints. We all have them, but none of them are the same. And the archetype of the fingerprint has no um, impetus to tell you whether your fingerprints are right or wrong. And Marie-Louise von Franz, who worked for many years as his personal assistant and is a famous right. Jungian analyst, said that um, she was saying um, all archetypes are contaminated. There's no such thing as a pure archetype because, for example, there's nobody with a mother that doesn't have a father. And if you study Steiner, he gets back to the archetypes at the very basis of creation, such as space, time, and movement. So mm -hmm. if you, what I'm saying is if you get behind the myth, ultimately you get to the components of a story, just like we have the alphabet to make language. But it seems to me, having studied archetypes quite extensively, that that would be the closest concept we could use to say what a myth clothes itself in so that it can become um, in comprehended right 
Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not in uh, disagreement with that. I just, it, it's not, um, it's not the way I, I uh, argued these points in the book. That's all. It's yeah, that's cool. I, I just, yeah. I just like to, when I have people like you that I can dialogue with, I like to share what rises in me just specifically for yeah. an opportunity yeah. to dialogue, you know? Absolutely. And help other people think differently about things. I think that's the beauty of a good conversation is is we are the story that's going to manifest itself in the other stories being told within the minds of people, which then become the story they share. And I think there we're seeing the spirit of myth right there. I used to, uh, now and then, not always, but I often uh, would add a question at the end of a final exam when I was teaching. Uh, what is the question is what is the most valuable thing you learned this semester? What is the most striking thing you learned? And I, I, I began to, to see uh, as uh, I, as I repeated this uh, practice that when I got answers from students that had nothing to do with the course, the course was successful. That's wild. <laughs> in, in other words, uh, you know, my, my, my happiest uh, moments were when I would read 10 exams in a row and each one had a different story and not one came from the class. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, I thought, damn, I'm, I'm really teaching these people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting them to go out there and do their own thinking. That's that's what a real teacher is supposed to do. Yeah, and, you know, that's I, what he's supposed to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem with academic institutions as a stereotype is they teach people what to think, not how to think, and that's a real problem, in my opinion. Oh, sure it is. Right. You know, one of the definitions of a myth that I find very beautiful is that a myth is something that never happened but is happening all the time. I'm wondering if you could share your interpretation of that definition of myth for us. Oh, I, I, I like that. No, that's 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 very nice. Yeah, it does happen all the time. Uh, a myth, a myth, really is um, um, a way of of framing a whole set of of otherwise confusing experiences and uh, or disconnected experiences, and and the uh, and even. Um, you, you know, I had certain uh, I had certain myths. I probably mostly made up about my own family uh, that helped me understand odd behavior or what I thought was odd or what was disturbing. And then later learned these myths were not at all the case. Uh, I, I framed I, I framed that behavior in a certain way that it made sense to me. But then I, I grew older and I, I had different perspective and the frame evaporated, turned, turned away, was thrown off. Uh, and, and I think what a myth can do is frame an experience and then, uh, but not permanently, ident not permanently fix it. So it's always stimulating our own narrative inner sense to tell, to put together all the things that are happening in our lives or many of the things, or some of the things, uh, into a story, into a narrative, in, into something that could be told again, uh, and so on. Uh, but not not fixed in time and place, necessarily. Right. And and so, that... Go ahead. No, that's, that's good. I was going to say that pretty much leads right into my next discussion point. On page 139, section 94... You begin the chapter by saying myth provokes explanation, but accepts none of it. Right. And, and that's really what you've just described in your right, own experience. Right right, right. right. Yeah. You know, you, you had your own framework, but as you evolved yourself and could see life and understand things at a deeper level, you realize that the framework wasn't really authentic to your current level of understanding. Right. That's right. Um. You state where the explanation absorbs the unspeakable into the speakable, myth reintro reintroduces the silence that makes original discourse possible. Now, that is a very 
uh, kind of a Mobius strip of a statement. <laughs> could no, could you elaborate on that? <laughs> a whole semester's worth right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's a, that's why I say it's a Mobius strip. You start on one side and you end up on the other and you keep going and you're on the other side again. <laughs> well, actually, what, what, what it means is that uh, what I was getting at there is that um, the uh, – it's it's one thing. It's one thing to tell a story that will silence you. It's another thing to present a silence that will cause you to tell a story. So, uh, if I if I if I let's say I set up a situation, and maybe do it accidentally or without design, uh, that requires something to be said, I close down. I leave a silence. I leave a gap. Right. And you will say, wait a minute, something more has to be said about this. Mm-hmm. And then, then you you come to speech because of it. And I see. Heard, that, that was one of the ways in which I taught. I, I, I wanted to teach in such a way that the, what I was saying, what I was teaching, let's say of giving a lecture on Nietzsche or somebody, uh, that I finished it, the students are looking like they're stunned, saying, what the hell does that mean? And then they, I, I, I wanted to do it in a way that when they left, they would fall into conversation about it. Yes. And, and rather than just shut up. So I tried, I tried it, now it wasn't manipulative. I mean, it was also the way I, you know, just the, the way I happened to teach, just happened to the kind of person I am. But but the um, I mean I, I I love to come to a point where every student left the class with a question. Now the question couldn't be so huge that it just turned them off. On the other hand, it couldn't be so trivial that they didn't bother to think about it. it yes, had be, it had to be right in the middle where they uh, they thought, wait a minute, this maybe I can figure this out. You know, maybe mm-hmm. we, let's let's go get coffee and. Uh, and have a beer and talk about this, uh, and and uh, uh, so that that's that's in a way what I'm talking about here. There's more to it. Uh, in fact, one one of the uh, elements I, I think very important in understanding the nature of the world is to realize that the world is not telling us the nature of the world. So, so far as we're concerned, nature is silent. It doesn't say what it is. It's silence is disturbing. We want to say what it is. I see. Yep. Yeah. So I, I, I read that part. Us. It provokes yeah. us. And when you, uh, and that's why uh, easy explanations, natural explanations are really not helpful. Uh, that, that is, you explain something away. You don't want to do that. Uh, yes. But, but you, you want to explain it in such a way that it leaves open questions and that 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 leaves the whole issue of nature still unspoken so what i mean by unspeakability is the fact that we are surrounded by 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 enormous silences both in nature and in our in our human and social lives and in space space itself right it's a You know, what rises in me (laughs) listening to you, how you handled the students and leaving that silence that provokes the story. It's very much like a Zen koan that you're you're giving them something that's not so challenging. Like, you know, if a Zen master says, what is the sound of one hand clapping that that might be too much for most students to handle. But it seems to me like you really have found the middle ground of being like a Zen master where you give them just enough of a koan to provoke them to uh, go into deeper reflection or conversation or processing on the issue. Well, that's certainly the design. Uh, You know, how often I was successful at that, you know, remains the question, but um, you, you, you described it correctly. Well, you got me. <laughs> okay. Here we are. <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> That's true. Yes, you are. Uh, most ex- It'd be fun most- having you as a student. I could tell that. Oh, my God, man. I'm, you know, I, I just, 
I love the treasure hunt. I really, you know, I think for me, the beauty of life, you know, yes, there's challenges and pains and trials and, you know, starts and things that don't work as well. But, you know, to me, those things are all sort of the superficial aspects of life. The deeper things to me are, you know, like if you've ever had the experience of making love to a woman and simultaneously orgasming and becoming one and completely losing yourself, yet becoming so united with the other that there's neither of you there. Th to me, that's like the silence that you're describing of behind myth. It it mm -hmm. leaves you speechless, but it leaves you wanting to search deeper into that experience of oneness where somehow the two of you merge so deeply that neither of you are there, but something even more amazing is created out of the experience. Right. But anyhow, um, uh, you know, most experts like uh, Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, James Hollis, and others agree that when a tribal or a cultural myth breaks down, people are very susceptible to falling into isms and wars are likely to emerge as a counter myth initiates a transitional state amongst the people. Could you share what our cultural myth was before it became consumerism and share where you feel North Americans or those in the industrialized nations are at now with regard to myth? And look into your crystal ball and tell us what you think is coming <laughs> Boy, at this don't. time. Yeah, don't I wish I could. Um, <laughs> I wish you could. The, I want you to try. <laughs> the um, yeah, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I, I I'm I'm troubled by uh, a lot of American history. Uh, somewhat inspired by it at the same time. Um, I, I'm very much aware that my family uh, has been here probably clo we're closing in on uh, two and a half centuries, but uh, I, I still um, feel a little bit like an intruder, th that uh, there's a whole uh, civilization here ahead of us. Uh, that that's now disappeared. Yes, uh, we have we have brought in, uh, forced in people from uh, Africa uh, with their cultures and did our best to wipe those cultures out. Thank God we didn't completely succeed. Amen. And uh, so th there's there's this uh, kind of darkness in the back our background as Americans. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, the 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 other elements in, in America of being an open, uh, free, accepting, uh, welcoming society, uh, capable of invention, of innovation, of novelty, of uh, uh, of profound expressions of culture in a great variety of ways. Uh, there's something about that that is also uh, irresistible. And so I, I, I find myself caught between two visions, one brilliant and one dark. And I, I have a feeling that uh, right now, I've read too much Calvin maybe, but, but I do feel that the dark is um, edging, the dark side is edging the light side. Yes, and it's I, sad. Uh, yeah. I hate to say it, but I think Donald Trump's really uh, the 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 embodiment of that consciousness. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I never thought it would happen, but you know, here it is. So yeah, I I I'm I'm extremely concerned about the environment and our inability even to think about it. Uh, as a nation, as a culture, and so on. Um, uh, but um, there's there's always a a spark of hope in that kind of vision. But maybe the spark is fading. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I keep it. It's an open question. 
but it is a question. You know, when I look at it from the perspective of depth psychology and what I've learned studying Jung for so long and Ken Wilber and others like that, and Steiner and all aspects of, of uh, you know, psychological healing is that the unconscious of our nation is now uh, manifesting itself in consciousness. So the kind of things that we've done in the past with wars and using political agendas to steal resources from all over the world and play the sort of same games many empires have done from the English to you name it. It seems that we're at a point now for us to really realize that we all need each other and that we need the planet and we have to work together to support the planet. We have to actually see the darkness that we were just turning over to the state and ignoring before. And it seems to me that Donald Trump is really as as scary and, and frustrating and sad as it can be to see the kinds of policy he has with regard to segregation and trying to build walls and drilling for oil and in ignoring the greenhouse effect and all the science behind that it's for me he's really bringing an outdated myth into consciousness creating a a counter myth so that the rest of us that are aware enough of what's going on can actually have a reason to voice ourselves because we can see that that myth if it continues itself uh, it does not have a pretty end to that story. Well, I think that may be where the spark is. Yes, I, I agree. I and think that, that is the spark. Yeah. So let's hope. Let's hope it catches fire. Yes. Uh, yes. Instead of uh, nature catching fire. Uh, well, that, the, right. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Fire, right. Yeah. yeah. If, we, if we let it catch fire in our spirits and we bring out the dialogue like we're doing right now and we get people that are more connected and have a broader scope of perception people like Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra and you know some of the other people out there that realize that it's time for us to become a one world community and it's interesting too because if you look at Joseph Campbell's uh explanations on how to interpret scripture he describes four levels of interpretation the lowest level is literal. The second level of interpretation is ethnocentric, which for those that don't know what that means, it means my group relative to your group or against your group. The third level is um, allegorical, a teaching story. And the fourth level, I believe the word's apophatic, but it means inspirational. It's if we have people that can look at the situations of the world and get past some of these kind of fundamentalist views of right and wrong that are very narrow in their scope. And we can start looking at things allegorically and then grow to seeing this as a possibility for inspiration where we can all work together as a family and as, as uh, citizens of the earth and as children of the earth. Because spiritually we may not be, but our physical bodies are certainly children of the earth. And I think if we, if we can get past some of these narrow minded you know uh viewpoints and you know that one of the problems i see with all this fundamentalist religion is it's so heavily polarized it, it just begs for battle and overlooks the fact that you're destroying the battleground playing the game and that happens to be what feeds you <laughs> yeah right right so, yeah uh you know the, I, I think we could end end here paul i i that fourfold interpretation scheme. Uh, Campbell got that from, it's interesting, he got it from the, uh, uh, from the Middle Ages. It was, uh, it was the way uh, early, well, Middle Age Christians, uh, beginning with Thomas Aquinas, uh, interpreted scripture. And he's, he's putting it, uh, giving it another, another grip. And, but it's interesting that that perception, that way of understanding things has been with us for a long time. And now, now we've really got to be more and more conscious and more applied and more focused on making that work, retelling the story, casting the myth now in a way that makes, that brings us together as a, a person that wants to, as a people that want to restore it the health and the unity of the earth. 
Yes, I agree. And thank you very much. Actually, it, uh, it wasn't Joseph Campbell. It was Houston Smith that I got that oh, construct that's, that's, from. That's why. Yeah, Houston knew that that stuff really well. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's why he, he uh, yeah, it comes from the uh, scholastics, 12th, right. 12th, 13th century. Well, I really appreciate this time with you, James. It's been fascinating for me. I'm sure that many of the listeners out there are probably uh, in a, in a, experiencing the silence after the story. And um, I'd love it if you could share uh, if there's any services you offer or where can people find more about you or your well, resources. You can, you can get to me on uh, jamescars.com. Okay, great. Yeah. And I know a, a lot of your books are on Amazon. Are they pretty much all there? Uh, they, all the ones that are worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I've written a few uh, that you don't, you don't, that won't make your life any better. There are a few, there are a few others, but uh, uh, some of them are very academic and and uh, you know not really suitable for the uh, the general public. They won't make much sense. Well, I can tell you one thing: if you really want to look at life from the perspective we've been sharing here, James's book "Finite Infinite Games" is not a big book, but it will keep you going for a long time. Like I said, and I think most of my listeners know, I'm I'm a pretty serious student. I have a very comprehensive library and I I can commit myself to reading that book at least once every six months until I reach the silence after the story. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. It's been an absolute pleasure. I would love to have you back again if you feel up to it and talk about the religious case against belief. Sure, I could do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, James Kass. You can find Dr. Kass online at www.jameskass.com. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and at the Czech Institute's new website, chekiva.com.